scavies are the very dregs of humanity, though they are so devolved and twisted that they can be hardly considered human anymore. They are severely deformed and often mutated by the toxic environment they live in. Scavies dress in rags and are caked in the most indescribable foulness. Their skin is a yellow and disgusting mass of sores, warts, blisters and cracks. Their limbs are often so withered or shriveled that crude hooks and peg legs are a common sight, though any scavy too crippled to defend himself is easy prey for his fellows. Scavies scratch out an existence in the most foul and polluted wastelands of the Underhive, hungrily watching for an opportunity to murder, rob and pillage anyone and anything nearby. Scavies have to band together to survive, and a typical band will be made up of several extended and severely inbred families. The dominant male in the band rules through brute strength, low cunning, and having as many siblings as possible to exert his will. Though individual scavies pose little threat to a well-armed gang, they are cunning enough to use traps, ambushes, and weight of numbers to even the odds. Occasionally, a scavy king will arise and unite several scavy bands into a ramshackle tribe. Such coalitions can create a ragged horde of scavies big enough to overrun settlements and trading holes. The excesses of King Blacknose the 81st are still remembered with a shudder in the Underhive, and the settlement of downtown has yet to recover from its period of rulership by the so-called Beggar King. Fortunately, scavy kings are usually more concerned with avoiding the attention of the authorities than conquest. They are far more likely to use fear, intimidation and exhaustion to get what they want. Their scrofulous subjects move in to blockade vital resources and charge underhive dwellers tolls and taxes whenever they have the numbers to get away with it. At times like these, the honest, hard-working settlers will look to gangs and bounty hunters to run the scavies off until life gets back to a normal again. Hello and welcome to Wellywood Wargaming. My name is Damon and in this video we'll be looking at the disgusting and wonderful world of scavies. Now that little excerpt of lore there was from an official Games Workshop publication back in 1996, I believe, called Outlanders, which was a, uh, and I believe the only uh, official supplement to the original Necromunda game, which came out in 1995. Um, this supplement, Outlanders, included new rules for campaigns, but it also mainly included rules for four or five new gangs. We had Spiras in there. We're not going to talk about those too much today. Ratskin Renegades, which I will probably do another video similar to this on quite soon. We also had the Redemptionists in there, which have been covered in the new iteration of the game. And of course, we had everybody's fan favorite, the Scavies. Now, the law that you got there kind of gave you an impression of The Hills Have Eyes, if you've seen those movies. A disgusting ragtag bunch of mutated inbred fuckwits. Um, rednecks, kind of like uh, Deliverance, I suppose. Jewel of the Banjos and all that. Very nasty indeed. Very colourful and very fluffy in terms of their lore. Now, I do feel that... With all of the new stuff that's come out for Necromunda, we have an absolute wealth of books. We have loads and loads of Apocrypha, Necromunda, Warhammer community sort of extra bits and bobs. We have White Dwarf um, articles and we've had loads of extra rules for stuff in the game. But we haven't really touched on the scavies yet properly. Now, most recently, we did have an Apocrypha, Necromunda, um, Warhammer community uh, sort of PDF that came out. Um, you can download that, and that's got all the mutations and stuff in it, which you can use in your outcast gangs. Um, however, I do feel that scavies still haven't got their place properly in modern Necromunda. Will they? Will Games Workshop actually release scavies at some point? I'm not sure they will. Um, so that's exactly what this video is for. I am going to be doing a, uh, a video in terms of exploring how one might go about porting scavies over from the original 96 Outlanders supplement into the modern game. We're going to be using Yak Tribe here, so shout out to Yak Tribe, and looking at all of the weapons, skills, mechanics, and where scavies actually fit in the modern game of Necromunda. Um, and how you might use them in the modern game of Necromunda as well. So if you're a bit of a veteran from back in the day, I think you'll enjoy this video. Of course, you're not going to agree with everything that I'm going to say here. Uh, you might have your own ideas, thoughts and opinions, and that's great. Please do comment down below and give me some feedback on this because it's, you know, it's going to be far from perfect, but I'd, I'd like to think with however, much, uh, however many years of experience that I've had with Necromunda that I kind of know 
uh, where these guys should sit in the new version of the game in terms of their stats, their skills, the mechanics, the weapons, all of that jazz. So before we get into it, please do like, share, subscribe, and um, check out the Patreon as well as we get into this scavy video. Okay, so before we get into the nitty gritty of what this video is actually about, let's just take a quick look at the illustration and artwork um, that inspired Scavies, and of course the miniatures that came off the back of those illustrations as well. The mighty John Blanche here um, depicting Scavies in their purest form. We've also got some Mark Gibbons work here of a scaly and I believe a, a plague zombie or a scavy here as well. But the miniatures that came off the back of these illustrations, I've got to say, weren't quite up to scratch, if you ask me. Even for back then, I just think, uh, as Old Hammer goes, these guys are not quite it. I think if you compare them to, say, the uh, Jez Goodwin's Escher, I believe he did those um, back in 95 as well, these guys just don't, don't quite cut it for me. However, if you like these guys back in the day um, then, and you're feeling nostalgic, I'm sure you could get them off eBay. Of course, they will be the metal pewter lead miniatures that we had back in the day, uh, which I don't particularly like using anymore or painting and using in my games because, I don't know, it's just not too practical, to be honest. But I imagine you could probably get some cheeky recasts of these in resin as well. Otherwise, though, the real reason why I love Scavies and why many of you, I think, will really, really love Scavies and want to play them in your games of Necromunda is because they are a kit basher's absolute wet dream. Um, you could use pox walkers, you could use bits of the new corridor kit, you could use hive scum bits, you could use gene stealer cult bits. There are an absolute plethora of Warhammer 40k uh, and even Warhammer fantasy models and kits that you could use to represent these guys and bash together. I'm actually doing it at the moment, so I'll probably post some pictures of my new scavy gang uh, up on Instagram, so do check those out um, shortly. But um, yeah, I think the miniatures are not the best, if I'm honest. But let's just take a look at them quickly. We've got a couple of leaders here. The leaders are actually the nicest ones by far. We've also got a blister pack of scavy mutants. There was a box set which came with, I don't believe it had mutants in it, but it did have at least one or two scalies in it, which are kind of like the heavies back in the day uh, for scavies. Um, scalies were like giant um, lizard-like reptilian sort of mutants, I suppose, and that's the champion for scavies. But generally, by the aesthetic, these guys are really decrepit-looking, hunched guys with very, very basic equipment and weapons here, as you can see. Just knives, blunderbusses, uh, auto pistols, stub guns. Very, very simple-looking weapons, um, very crude and harsh-looking weapons. And we're going to look at those actual weapons, some of the uh, unique ones that Scavies have got and how to port them over into the new version of the game. But also, you can see here exactly the kind of kit and war gear that you're going to get on a Scavi list uh, once you do include them in modern Necromunda. Anyway, let's look at sort of the actual uh, special rules and how they operated back in 96, I suppose it is now, when Outlanders came out. Now, these guys were kind of like, I suppose they were the Horty gang in the game. So currently we have, you know, Cordor are sort of considered the modern Horty gang. You generally have more fighters than your, than your opponent with, with Cordor gangs. Uh, and they kind of replaced Scavies in that sort of dynamic, I suppose, in the new version of the game. You could also say that Outcast Gangs can be particularly hoardy as well, but they don't have any sort of mechanic to get extra bodies into the game like Cordor do with their Bone Pickers and Gangers as well. These guys, back in the day, were exactly that. You had Plague Zombies that for 10 credits you could add to your gang and you get D6 of them each game. And they were kind of like a really annoying screen of zombies. We're going to look at the mechanics and how they would work in the new game for those as well. Um, but in terms of the play style, the long and short of it was these guys were kind of like Cordor in terms of their hoardiness. They had very, very basic equipment. They weren't very good at shooting. They weren't very good at fighting. They were just incredibly cheap bodies that were generally just a mass around the opponent and try and bring them down that way. So that's really the play style that you're going to be looking at. And that's the play style that I'm going to try and represent and replicate into the new version of the game here. So let's get into that and see how that might be done. Okay, so looking at the front page of the scavies in the Outlanders rulebook, we can see that these, the way that they're structured, um, the way that these pages are structured in the old um, rulebooks and whatnot is much the same as your new rulebooks. Typically, you have a little bit of lore at the top, um, a little uh, illustration, in this case by the mighty John Blanche again, and then you have a bunch of special rules and gang composition before you actually get into the fighter types, war gear, and other flotsam and jetsam that you've got here. 
A lot of this in the special rules here, I'm not going to go into any depth on because really some of it crosses over, some of it doesn't um, because the, the way that the, the game was structured back in N95 is, is fairly different, to be honest. Some of it's similar, some of it's different. Um, I'll give you some examples here. There's a little section that talks about Outlanders, basically just reiterating that these guys are always unlawful, I suppose, always outlaws in the game, and that makes sense from a fluff perspective. So if you're playing them in a campaign, these guys are always outlaws. I would agree with that, and I would use that in the new version of the game as well. We've then got some stuff about starting territory and income, which really... Um, if you were to use this in modern Dominion campaigns, means that these guys only get one territory and that's it. They can never go above one territory, which I think would be very, very harsh. But again, that could be used by an arbitrator just to uh, reiterate just how poor and ill-equipped these guys are in the game compared to everyone else. But where you're getting the rest of your money from is, is going to be hard to come by, I think. But I can't. that's kind of the point, I suppose, with scabbies. They are the poorest of the poor. We've then got a little section, a little juicy section, uh, describing cannibalism and how that works in starvation. So starvation is a modern mechanic within the Uprising campaign. So you could use this little bit of cannibalism there, basically saying that if you can't give them enough meat, they will eat their own guys, which is pretty cool. We've then got a little bit about bounty as well, whether you use bounties in your modern version of the game. These guys, uh, I would just say that maybe they're slightly more valuable to, to guilders or something, I'm not really sure. Um, and then you've got scavy weapons as well, suggesting that scavy, scavy weapons are more unreliable because they're more rusty and just generally fucked. Um, so uh, if you hit, if your hit roll is a one or a six in the old version of the game, then uh, you have to make an ammo roll. I would say that I've got ways of remedying this with the plethora of weapons and war gear in the new version of the game, uh, and I'm going to sort of explain how I get round this. Instead of just porting over this law, this rule, uh, I'm going to I'm going to sort of just represent that in the types of equipment they get instead. So that's the special rules there. Let's have a look at the sort of gang composition now. All right then, so scavies in terms of gang composition. Um, let's have a look at how they look in Outlanders and how you might port them over to the modern version of the game. Um, it's pretty, again, it's pretty straightforward here. We have a scavy boss, which is your leader type. You can only have one scavy boss, and when your scavy boss dies, you know, the next guy in charge would take over. Um, but your scavy boss here, we're going to take a look at the actual stats shortly, but I'm just going to go through quickly how the gang actually um, is assembled, I suppose. Your scavy boss is there. You then have your champions, which are known as scalies. Scalies are the giant hulking brutes, which are similar to kind of aberrants crossed with ogrins, I suppose. You're going to see uh, what I mean by that shortly. We then have scavies, but we also have scavy mutants. Now, there is a little bit of um, stuff around how scavy mutants work compared to just general scavies without mutations. And here is the sort of main idea that I've come up with for this. Now, I have done a video on the mutations that came out with Apocrypha Necromunda which many, many people are excited about. As you can see here, we've got a very limited stripped back version of that. Uh, in the old uh, version, in Outlanders, we, we only have a few mutations. In the newer Apocrypha Necromunda, we have way more, and they're much more fun and colourful, uh, and of course uh, brought up to date with the modern rules of the game. So we've got some special rules around scavy mutants here that I'm just going to quickly go through. Scavies are often mutated by their dreadful living conditions. Most of these mutations are simply horrible and inconvenient web things fingers, extra toes, tentacles for noses. Tentacles for noses? Sounds disgusting. Anyway, moving past that, any scavy may be purchased as a mutant when he is recruited by choosing a mutation from the list below. A mutant may only have one mutation and it is rare for mutations to be duplicated within the same gang. To represent this, the first mutant to take a mutation pays the cost shown for it. The second mutant to take the same mutation must pay double the cost shown and the third one um, to take the same mutation pays triple the cost and so on. This is a really great rule and I actually think this gets round the spamming of some of the more powerful mutations in the modern table that we're going to take a look at. Uh, soon because some of them are far too cheap and far too good if you ask me and what this does if we keep this rule and port it over to the modern version of scavies that we're doing here I actually think this rule solves a lot of issues around the the spamming of these uh, mutations the other thing we've got here as well is in terms of recruitment is that um, and, and a nice little rule here as well is, um, unsurprisingly enough, scavies always make up the bulk of a scavy gang. To represent this, at least half of the models in the gang must be scavies, not mutants. 
If the number of scavies falls below half the strength of the gang, only scavies can be recruited until at least half the gang is made up of scavies again. So I really like this rule. I would probably say that a better version of it would, was, would be to have more scavies than scavy mutants, um, to just make it as simple as that. If you've got, say, four scavy mutants, you would need to have four or more at least scavies just to be uh, balancing it out. I really like this. Again, it's quite a hoardy gang, so you certainly can ha still have lots of mutants, but I do quite like that. It's a nice little rule to keep to keep in this game anyway. So that's how the scavy mutants and the scavies work. Of course, scavies are your gangers. They're not champions. Your scalies are your champions. Uh, your boss is your boss, and scavies and mutants are just that. The last thing we have, though, is the unique and flavorful sort of fluffy mechanic that we've got for scavies here, and that is, of course, plague zombies or... I guess in the new version of the game, they're known as brain leaf zombies, but we're going to go and take a look into the fighter types now and see what that represents. Okay, so let's get into the actual fighter types now and how they might cross over into the new version of the game. So let's start with the boss here, the scavy boss. Now this guy cost 100 credits to recruit back in 96, and I would say that this guy for 100 credits is a little bit expensive, but... After much deliberation and thought, I'm actually going to keep the same credit costs for every single fighter type in this. Now, that might be controversial for you, but I do think that actually using the credit costs that we've got here for the champion, the leader, the gangers, and the plague zombies, I actually think leads to a fairly balanced and decent representation of these guys. So we're going to keep the credit cost here. So moving the scavy boss over to the modern version of the game, we're going to stay with 100 credits here. Um, but let's look at the stats quickly. This guy is your leader, um, and he's not a particularly great one in terms of the stats here. Now, some of the stats are missing, and the way that stats are interpreted in the old version of the game is slightly different. Instead of having 3 plus, 4 plus, 5 pluses, we have um, a sort of scale in terms of a table. So what we've got here is movement 4, which used to be the average. Um, so I would say that we changed that to movement 5. We've got weapon skill 4 and ballistic skill 3 here. So you might read that if you're playing the modern version of the game saying that he has better ballistic skill with a 3 uh, and worse weapon skill. It's actually the other way around. So the higher the number, um, the better the roll. So a 4 for weapon skill would usually mean a 3+, plus uh, in terms of the actual table that you're rolling to hit on in close combat. And a 3 for ballistic skill would usually mean a 4+. plus. So it's the other way around to what you might expect. So the scavy boss here has a weapon skill of 4, 3+, plus in the modern version of the game. It has a ballistic skill of 3, 4 plus in the modern version of the game. So very similar to a Palanite captain in terms of those two stats there. We have a strength and toughness of 3. Again, very average. One wound, which let's say uh, is a little bit um, scant, I would suppose. In fact, all leaders in the new version of the game have two wounds. At least this guy should certainly have two wounds as well. Uh, initiative of a 4, uh, which is usually a 3 up as well one attack and a leadership of seven. Now let's look at what I've done for the modern guy here. Uh, I've changed it to movement five because that is the new average. We've got a weapon skill of three plus, we've got a ballistic skill of four plus, strength and toughness three, I've changed the wounds to two. Initiative, I've actually upped to a four plus because I do feel like this guy is going to be a decrepit old hunchback buffoon. So I think four plus is actually quite good. And again, actually very, very similar to the Palanite Enforcer Captain stats here so far. We've got two attacks as well, and then for the mental stats, I've actually changed things a little bit. Leadership, I've made better to a 6+, plus because I think 7 is just not good enough for any leader. Cool, I've gone with 6+, plus here, so not the best in the pack, but still better than average. And then willpower and intelligence, I've given him 7 pluses for those as well. Now, it's not the best leader stat line, is it? Um, it's arguably one of the worst. It's probably worse than the demagogue in terms of the uh, you know helot cults. Uh, and it's arguably worse than the Palanite captain there as well. And for 100 credits, he is somewhat expensive. However, with the cost of the other guys in this gang, I think that kind of balances things out. Anyway, in terms of the equipment that he gets and stuff and the special rules, of course, I've given him the, um, you know, leading by example rule of 12 inches. So he's got that 12 inch bubble uh, for, for, for bottle checks and whatnot. And also um, group activation two there as well. No other special rules uh, other than that. Um, he's, he's given basic weapons, pistols, uh, close combat, uh, uh, grenades, etc. So no special weapons and no heavy weapons on this guy either. So very similar to the loadout that you'd get on your Colt demagogue. Let's look at the next fighter type. 
Now for the champions and a really unique and interesting sort of piece in Necromunda. Now, let's just bring up the uh, stats for these guys back in Outlanders. Scalies. So these guys are hulking brutes, similar to sort of aberrants and ogrins, I suppose, like a hybrid version of that. Uh, and they have a number of special rules as well, which we can totally port over and reflect in the new version of the game too. These guys are 120 credits, which is quite expensive. But again, I'm actually going to keep... The, the cost there, 120 credits, um, as I feel it still sort of balances out and keeps things looking pretty good. And these guys are not to be trifled with. They certainly are quite good, that's for sure. So let's look at the stats that we had back then. These guys had a movement of four. Again, average. Uh, we had a, a weapon skill of four, which is pretty good. Ballistic skill of three, uh, average. We had strength five, toughness four, two wounds, initiative two. That's actually very bad. Two attacks and a leadership of nine. Awful, awful, awful stuff. Uh, I'm then going to actually just look at the special rules around these guys before I get into the rest of it. Uh, these guys have their own equipment list, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, but we have scaly skin, um, because these guys are called scalies. They do have a sort of reptilian skin, and that gives them a 5 plus armor save for free. So they've got an inbuilt mesh armor there. So if you take that into account in terms of their cost, that's 15 credits uh, rolled into that already. We've also got Killer Rep as well, so I've given them the Fearsome skill, which is one of the ferocity skills in the game, to represent this as well. And they also have a special rule which is just great called Regenerate as well. I'm just going to read you that one uh, from the Outlanders rulebook here. Scalies can regenerate lost fingers, toes, and even hold limbs in time, through the, though the process is painful and slow. Roll a d6 for each serious injury a scaly has after each game, regardless of whether the scaly has fought in it or not. Uh, and that just gets rid of it on a, what was it, 4+, plus, I believe? Um, oh, no, sorry. On a roll of a 6, uh, you get rid of all of your um, serious injuries and stuff, even if they're good ones as well, like impressive scars and whatnot. Again, you could use that totally in the new version of the game, easy peasy. And again, I think those three things, you've got, you know, fearsome, you've got the 5+, plus armor save, and you've got regeneration rolled into the cost of 120 credits, I think is not too bad at all. Let's just look at the sort of uh, new version of the scaly that I've created here as well. Uh, bear with me a second. That's the scabby boss there. Um, but yeah, these guys have got a special um, equipment list as well. Um, but first, we'll just have a look at how the stats kind of compare to modern day. So this is what I've got for my um, scaly now. We've upped the movement to 5 because that is the, the new average. Weapon skill is 3+, plus. ballistic skill is 4+. plus. So I thought originally I could have the ballistic skill slightly worse than that. But these guys are your champions, so they need to be at least okay. We've got strength 5, which is fantastic, and toughness 4. So very similar to an aberrant in terms of the stats there. We've got two wounds, an initiative of five plus, which is not great at all. Uh, two attacks, and in terms of the mental stats here, I've kept the leadership of nine, because these guys should be big sort of cowards, a bit stupid. Uh, they've got a call of seven plus, a willpower of eight plus, and an intelligence of nine plus there as well. So not great, um, but we're keeping all of those skills there, uh, all those special abilities that they've got there too. Um, I'm going to get into the sort of skills and the equipment that these, can, these guys can have afterwards, but let's look at the next fighter type now. So the next fighter type is your ganger. Um, scalies, just quickly, um, I don't think I actually mentioned it. Scalies are your champions. So um, they are champions in every in every way. They have group activation one, and they'll have that six-inch bubble of leading by example as well. Otherwise, they um, behave exactly like champions and level up, just like other champions in the game too. But let's look at scavies now. These are your gangers and the bulk of your gang. Now, remember what I said about mutants, you can have up to half of these can be mutants um, and you can purchase mutations, uh, you know, when they're recruited as well. So each of these guys can have one, uh, one uh, you know, actual mutation when they're created uh, for the cost that they're worth on the actual list that we're going to look at shortly. Um, but yeah, scavies, cost to recruit, 25 credits, incredibly cheap, cheaper, uh, in fact, than a hive scum for 30 credits. Now, they're not as good as a hive scum, though, so that's purposefully why they're 25 credits credits and again I'm going to keep them at 25 credits because I do think that that actually represents a, a decently balanced list here um, but let's look at the stats here we've got movement for weapon skill three ballistic skill two so these guys definitely are not as good at shooting as they are at close combat in the old version of the game strength and toughness three one wound initiative three attacks one and leadership six there so um, 
Regarding everything we said about mutations, these guys can be equipped with ranged weapons, close combat, but we can't have a specialist. So I'm going to stick with the sort of same sort of thing that you've got going for outcast gangs and not give them access to heavy weapons or special weapons at all. It just doesn't really suit them uh, in terms of the fluff, if you ask me. But looking at the way that I've ported these over to the modern game in Yak Tribe here, we've got a movement of five, so bringing them up to the average movement that they that they have. Uh, we've got a weapon skill of four plus and a ballistic skill of five plus. So not great shooting at uh, one in three chance to hit stuff most of the time um, is definitely worse than a hive scummer the strength and toughness of three though wounds one initiative four up which is average attacks one and the mental stats are all leadership eight cool eight willpower eight and intelligence eight so they are exactly the same as a hive scum except they are one worse in terms of ballistic skill represented in their 25 credit cost there so that is your scavy. Of course, your mutant is going to is going to behave slightly differently because your mutant is going to have mutations, which might bring the stats up in some ways, uh, like vast bulk gives you plus one wound, etc., uh, and give you some extra abilities and stuff, which represent uh, you know are represented in the cost there as well. And that is your ganger. Let's look at the special one now, though. All right, then, now for the most exciting part. Instead of getting juves, scavies get something called plague zombies. Uh, and if you want to be true to the modern lore, I suppose you could say brain leaf zombies because these guys are very similar. Um, but for 10 credits, 10 measly credits, you can pay to leave the scraps of your dead enemies, like fingers and ears and noses and stuff, uh, to lure plague zombies to your cores and send them in the direction of the enemy. Really, really cool indeed. So for 10 credits, you get D6 Plague Zombies before each battle. Make sure you have those 10 credits handy, though, because uh, these guys are really, really great. Um, D6, though, so it's pretty variable. Sometimes you'll get one, which I still think is worth the 10 credits. Sometimes you'll get six, which is just fantastic. These guys aim as, you know, are, are basically a screen uh, to send out there in, in the direction of your opponent and just cause havoc and get in the way of things while your scavies run around the back of it um, shooting and uh, doing all sorts of other shenanigans. So these guys are pretty great. Um, now let's look at the stats in the original Outlander version of the game. We've got movement 2d6, so they're pretty erratic in terms of their movement, just like a zombie would be if they were real, I suppose. Are they real? I hope not. Um, they have a weapon skill of 2, which is not great. A ballistic skill of 0, which is the worst. Uh, they have a strength and toughness of 3, 1 wound, initiative 1, which is dreadful, 1 attack, and a leadership of 5. But they've got all manner of special rules that come with them as well, and some of these cross over into brain leaf zombies, some of them don't. Um, but let's just have a quick look at some of these. We've got zombie shuffle. Plague zombies usually stagger around um, with broken, faltering steps. Occasionally, when they get the scent of blood in their decaying nostrils, they will break into a loping, shambling run. To represent this unpredictable gait, plague zombies move 2d6 in the movement phase. Each plague zombie is rolled for individually, and the controlling player may move them as he wishes up to the distance rolled on the dice. Plague zombies may not run or charge. They will always move 2d6. However, plague zombies always count as charging into hand-to-hand -hand combat if they manage to move into base to base with an enemy model pretty straightforward and i believe the same as the brain leaf zombies there <coughs> the next special rule that the um the plague zombies have here is no pain plague zombies feel no pain whatsoever you can burn them shoot them and cut them and they'll just keep trying to bite you until you manage until you manage to inflict crippling damage on them because of this plague zombies ignore being pinned and are not affected by flesh wounds again these two rules can easily be ported over to the modern version of the game and i would say absolutely keep them these guys are unpinnable i would say uh, except by uh, the trait that I believe you have on Seismic, which pins everything anyway. I'd say Seismic would still work on these guys, but otherwise they are unpinnable, of course. They're unflappable. Um, they just want to eat your brains. The next thing is they have no fear. So as the reasoning parts of their brains are long gone, plague zombies lack the intellect to be afraid of anything. This means that plague zombies ignore all psychological rules and never have to roll leadership tests to see whether they lose their nerve. If the gang controlling the plague zombie bottles out, the zombie pack loses its motivation and scatters as well. So if they if your gang bottles, these guys also bottle, but I would say they automatically fail intelligence checks, they automatically fail leadership checks, but they probably automatically pass willpower and call checks as well. And I think that's pretty much exactly the same as your brain leaf zombies as well. 
The next thing you have here is plague, of course, because these guys are plague zombies. So if uh, if a gang member is uh, taken out by one of these guys, um, things can get quite interesting. Um, so you roll a d6 on the table below to see whether you're infected. Um, note that this is in addition to serious injury roll if the fighter goes out of action. So if you get taken out of action by a plague zombie, this is what happens. You roll a d6 on this table. On a 4 to 6, zombie time, the gang member is infected and suffers brain death within hours. Roll a d6. On a 4 to 6, the new zombie wanders off into the waste to join his fellows. On a roll of 1 to 3, the zombie attacks a randomly determined gang member. Fight out Fight out the close combat immediately. In either event, all the model's equipment is infected and counts as destroyed. Really harsh, and that's a 50-50 as well. The next one is 2 to 3. Sickness. The victim feels weak and ill for days and must miss the gang's next fight while he recovers. So you go into recovery. And then on a one clear, after a few tense days, no symptoms of zombie plague have emerged and the gang member is in the clear. However, <laughs> that does sound really harsh, but we do have some uh, D6 modifiers down below as well. We have um, minus two if you only suffered a flesh wound. We have um, minus two if you're not reduced to zero wounds. I'm not sure how that would work in the modern version of the game, though. Uh, we also have uh, a friendly doc is part of the gang's territory. So if you have a rogue doc, it's also minus two to this roll. Um, a member of a gang has the medicay skill or medic skill as it was known back then is also minus one or if the gang has a medicay pack as well um, it'd be a minus one too so all of those things can cross over into the new version of the game and why shouldn't they fantastic love these guys what's not to like there um yeah that's plague zombies all right, so those were your main fighter types. We have the Scavi boss, which is your leader. We have the Scalies, which are your champions. We have the Scavies and the Mutants, which are your gangers. And then we have your special guys or prospects, I suppose, which would be your plague zombies. Pretty straightforward stuff there. And I would say all of that makes for some interesting stuff that is quite unique and doesn't currently exist in the new version of the game. Hence me doing this video. Now let's look at the sort of skill access that you might get uh, in the game here. Now let's bring up the table, the scavy skill list from the original Outlanders uh, source book here. We have um, really, really similar um, sort of skill tables here. We have agility, the same as the modern version. Combat, the same as the modern version. Ferocity, the same as the modern version. Muscle, which is now called brawn. We have shooting, which is still the same. We have stealth, which is now cunning. And we have techno, which is the same as savant, basically. Um, so those are your core skill lists. Nothing really remains changed there, so I'm just going to keep things exactly the same. Let's have a look at it, though. The Scavi boss gets access to pretty much everything here except techno skills. I would say in the new version of the game, you usually only your leader usually only gets access to leadership and then two other skill tables as primary. I would say in this instance that... Um, cunning and ferocity would probably be the two skill trees I would add to leadership for the boss here and that's exactly what I've done so cunning leadership and uh, ferocity I think are the main skill tables that make the most sense for your scabby boss the next one would be your scalies now of course these guys are hulking brutes so you must give them muscle of course they get muscle skills here so brawn skills makes a lot of sense I would also give them ferocity skills as well as a primary those would be the two skill trees that I would give my my scaly champions in terms of scalies though uh, sorry in terms of scavies though of course you get mutations on the mutants uh, and in terms of the primary primary skill tables otherwise I would say that you would also give them probably ferocity and cunning as the main two skill trees there uh, now that is the same as helots and it is the same as gene stealer cultists but I think it really does fit in with the sort of fluff and narrative behind scabby so that is your skill table and that is the stuff that we're going to draw from when we build a list in yak tribe now let's take a look at the scavy weapon and war gear list. Of course, there are far more weapons and war gear and items of equipment uh, in the new version of the game than there used to be back in Necromunda. But let's have a quick look at the table that was included in Outlanders because it's very, very brief. Uh, for basic weapons, we have auto guns, auto pistols, blunderbusses, hand bows, muskets, shotguns and stub guns. Um, those, those are your sort of ranged weapons. In fact, they were all grouped into ranged weapons rather than pistols, special, basic, etc. We then have a scaly weapons list, which has a spear gun, scatter cannon, and a discus slash throwing axe. Very interesting stuff there, and we're going to look at that in a second. We then have close combat. We have clubs, mauls, and bludgeons, chains and flails, massive axe, sword or club, knife and sword. And then for grenades and shotgun shells, we have frag grenades, toxic bombs, gunk bombs, 
uh, man stopper shells, hot shot shells, bolt shells, and dum dum bullets for your stub gun as well. So that is all you get for your scavy weapons list. So let's take a look at how I've included those in the new and updated version of uh, the game. Uh, let's just get to the table that I created for this. Where are we? Where are we? There we are. Okay, so starting off with ammo. Uh, now I've given sawn off solid rounds and dum-dums are the only types of ammo that you can get for scavies here. Uh, moving into armor, we've got flak armor, gutter forge cloaks, scrap shields and hazard suits are the only types of armor you can take on your scavies. Uh, for basic weapons, we've got reclaimed auto guns. I think reclaimed weapons in general makes a lot of sense for these guys, uh, meaning the, the ammo is a 5 up instead of a 4 up. And that's what I was talking about earlier with that special rule, meaning that scavies just don't have good equipment. Giving them reclaimed auto guns instead of ordinary auto guns makes a lot of sense. They do not have access to regular auto guns. We then have shotguns though, we have sawn off shotguns, we have a hand bow, which is exactly the same stats wise as a wild bow, I'm going to explain that shortly as well. We've got throwing knives, which I think do fit in with the um, sort of, uh, you know, general fluff of these guys too. We have throwing axes, available for your scalies. We have blunderbusses, muskets and stub cannons, which I've included there from the Goliath list as well, because I do feel like the stub cannon kind of fits in fluff wise as well. In terms of pistols, only two here. We have the scavenged, scavenged stub gun, and we also have the reclaimed auto pistol there too. And for close combat, we have axes, clubs, cleavers, knives, flails, heavy clubs, mauls, swords, pole arms, pole arms, sorry, um, two-handed hammers, two-handed axes, and two-handed weapons in general. And then for equipment here, we've got filter plugs, uh, grapnel launchers, low sticks, respirators, second best, skin blades, and wild snake. Um, your grenades here, we have gunk bombs, incendiary charges, and blasting charges, so no smoke or flash or anything fancy there. Um, and for heavy weapons, we've only got the harpoon launcher, which I think is the wise decision as it comes on the original Scaly model. Um, for special weapons, I've included flamers, long rifles, and scatter cannons as well, a uh, weapon that is unique to Scalies too. Let's have a look at how we use those in the modern game. So, now looking at the weapons that we have for scavies in the Outlanders book, we have hand bows, muskets, and blunderbusses, slash scatter guns. These are all available for your generic scavies. These aren't your scaly weapons, so let's just have a quick look at those. The hand bow in question, I think, is an easy port over from the wild bow included on your Escher Wild Runners. These guys have a 0 to 8 short inch range, uh, an 8 to 16 long range, minus 1 to hit a long range, strength 4. Damage one, and uh, they have a special save and a six up ammo. Um, now these guys are uh, move or fire as well, which I think is um, not the best for this. I think personally, we just change it to the wild bow and include that for 10 credits. Wild bows are pretty naff anyway, but 10 credits is not too bad. This one, strength four and move or fire, I just think I'd rather just keep the, the, the wild bow at strength three, to be honest, and use that instead. Uh, the musket's quite interesting. I have made a new version of the musket. Again, it's pretty crap, um, but I'm going to really look at this a lot more when it comes to rat skins because I don't think you're really going to want to take the musket for your scavies because you do have better options. Now, this thing in the original version of the game has a 0 to 12 inch short range, a 12 to 24 long range. No uh, modifiers to short range, but a minus one to hit at long range, so not that accurate. It's strength three, damage one, and minus one save with a six up ammo. So kind of like a mini long rifle in its minus one, but it hasn't got knockback or anything either. So I've changed that to a new version as well. Um, you know, just changing the stats slightly to make it uh, make it more interesting. But I have kept the move or fire rule, making it a double to shoot your musket instead of a basic because I do think that is something that fits quite narratively with it as well. Um, the other one that we've got here is the blunderbuss slash scattergun. Um, in uh, Outlanders, it did have a sort of set range. It wasn't a template weapon, but I have basically just brought in the... Um, not the purgation rounds, the uh, scatter shot rounds that you get from your blunder buses on your blunder poles from Cordor and just included them as a gun without the actual pole arm supplement for 30 credits. I think that's quite good. Again, they're still pretty powerful. You haven't got the flaming rounds. You just have the um, grape shot version. That's what it was, grape shot. Um, for 30 credits, I think is really good. And those are the three sort of main 
weapons that we have for your scavies there. Let's just take a look at the scaly weapons as well before I move into explaining how I've ported those over as well. We have the spear gun, um, we have the scatter cannon, and we have the discus and throwing axe. The scatter cannon here is an interesting one. Actually, it's 0 to 8 inch short range, 8 to 16 inch long range, so similar to a shotgun, plus 3 modifier at short range, minus 1 at long range, so a bit uh, kooky that one. Strength 4, damage 1, minus 1 AP, and 6 up ammo. But this one has a 2 inch blast marker, so this small uh, grenade sized blast marker. Again, personally, I'm not so sure about using the stats from this and porting them over to the new version of the game, so I think there are two choices here. We either give them stub cannons, which are available for Goliaths, kind of make a lot of sense from a sort of fluff perspective, they're just big stub guns, or we make a slightly better version of a blunderbuss, giving it strength 4 instead of strength 3 with those grape shots. So still scatter shots, still a template, maybe strength 4 and knockback as well um, to make the scatter cannon actually make sense. In terms of the spear gun, uh, again, I would just use the harpoon launcher as it makes a lot of sense. It's very, very similar to the original stats here. Um, however, the spear gun was strength 6 instead of strength 5. Uh, it was also uh, 3 damage as well. Um, but I think the, the, the modern spear gun is quite an interesting weapon to use and you're definitely going to use it in a scabby gang because you can uh, impale people and pull them towards your plague zombies ready for them to devour some brains. So that's pretty cool as well. The last one is the discus slash throwing axe. This one's quite interesting. Uh, and again, slightly different. I've basically made a version of a throwing knives and just made it sort of crossed over throwing knives with this with the profile of an axe and I'll explain how in a second but the original version of it was 0 to 6 short range uh, 6 to 12 inch long range uh, no uh, negatives for short and long uh, or positives and strength 5 damage 1 minus 1 AP and 6 up ammo no special rules there at all that's that so then, looking at how I have ported those weapons over into the modern iteration of the game, firstly the blunderbuss, I think just using the grape shot profile from the Cordor blunder pole. Uh, it is a template, it has strength 2, damage 1, 6 up ammo, plentiful and scatter shot. For 30 credits, it is an excellent cheap uh, template weapon, but it's not that scary, it's not the one that has blaze, which is very very scary indeed, I think. Uh, 30 credits is pretty good for this. Scatter shot and strength too. I like this one. Um, but yeah, plentiful with a 6 up ammo means that it runs out easily, but you can also reload it with general shrapnel and shit that you find on the ground. Pretty cool, pretty fluffy, very nice. Uh, the next one is the wild bow. Again, I've just ported the wild bow over. For 10 credits, it's a short range of 9, long range 18 inches with a minus 1 to hit a long range. It's strength 3, damage 1, 4 plus ammo and silent as well with no different variations on the types of ammo that you get for that, unfortunately, because these guys are scabbies. The next thing that we've got is the musket. This is the sort of most interesting one here. And again, I'm going to say this is 10 credits because it's kind of a shit weapon, but... The musket's quite interesting. I'm going to say that it's it's a double action to shoot this because it does require actually loading it properly each time. Uh, it's 12 inch short range, 24 inch long range, minus one to hit at long range. So exactly the same as the musket I just went through in the original Outlanders version. However, instead of strength four, it's strength three. It's damage one, minus one AP, six up ammo, and I've put knockback and plentiful on it as well to make it a little bit more viable. I just think as a choice, having something with knockback in your gang list is quite helpful there as well. Now let's just have a quick look at the scaly weapons that we were talking about here. The throwing axe or discus, um, I've used the same profile for range as you do have for your throwing knives. So strength times two for short range, strength times four for long range, meaning that a uh, scaly can throw this 20 inches tops, which is pretty cool. However, at minus one to hit at long range. They are the same strength as user, so strength five in this instance. They're only available for scalies. They're only five credits, but they are one shot, one damage, knock back, pulverize, one shot. Pretty cool, I think, just having a weapon that's extremely cheap that you can only use once, which might not hit. Um, five credits, I think, is, is well costed for this. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there. The Harpoon Launcher, of course, is already a weapon in the game, so there's no point in going through that one just at the moment. But the Scatter Cannon, what I've done with the Scatter Cannon here is make a Strength 4 version of the um, 
the grape shot uh, blunder blunderbuss. It's damage one. It's minus one AP. It's a six up ammo with knockback and scatter shot and plentiful as well. So really nice there too. And those are the sort of scaly and scabby weapons ported over into the modern iteration of the game. Let me know what you think in the comments down below of those. But I think those are pretty fair, decent examples of the weapons represented on the scabby list. All right, so that's all the sort of core mechanics spoken about. Now we get on to the topic of how you might implement this in Yak Tribe. Now I am going to do a separate video actually on how to use Yak Tribe. I think that would be a really good thing to do. But again, massive shout out to Yak Tribe. If you haven't used Yak Tribe yet, then of course just go Google Yak Tribe and you'll see exactly what I'm on about. It's where we create uh, gang lists and manage campaigns uh, in the game of Necromunda and to be honest without Yak Tribe I don't know where we'd be as a community it is a fantastic fantastic resource uh, one of the best resources for Necromunda of course uh, and like I said without it I actually don't know what I would do um, but you can use Yak Tribe to customize create weapons weapon stats uh, new types of fighters and all sorts of stuff in there again I'm not going to get into too much detail at the moment but if you go into Yak Tribe and go to the customize option on the under high, the main underhive tool, um, there are ways of creating new weapon stats for, say, the blunderbuss, the throwing axe, stuff like that. And I've done all this here and included it in in an example list for you for my scavies here. So. Have a play with that, see what you can do. You can also create custom ganger types and input the stats for these guys. Or if you're really savvy with this and you already use uh, Yak Tribe, just get in touch with me if you'd like to clone this gang because you can act as a clone button. You can go to this gang, you can clone it, and you can start using it yourself, tweaking and changing things in your campaigns. And yeah, uh, you know, be my guest. Use this if you really like it. Now I'm going to give you an example of a list that I've created here using all of the available weapons, skills and uh, stuff that we can use in the idea that I've got for my scavy list here. So starting off with the scavy boss, for 150 credits we get a shotgun with solid and scatter, reclaimed auto pistol and a gutter forged cloak. The skill that I've given my scavy leader here is evade, which is, means that you're harder to hit in the open. Quite a nice sort of sneaky, sneaky skill there. But again, you could go with leadership, you could go with cunning, or you could go with ferocity and get nerves of steel or something a bit more optimal. But I'm not the optimal guy. I like to go with the fluffy stuff. I've got two scalies here. The first scaly is uh, the first champion scaly, I suppose, is a 205 credit uh, piece with a throwing axe for five credits and a scatter cannon um, with bull charge and fearsome. Of course, they come with fearsome. They also have regenerate and that five up armor as well. So you don't need to give these guys armor. And I've given him bull charge just because it's a cool skill and it fits in quite narratively and fluffy, I think, with the uh, scaly being a big hulking brute. The second scaly that we've got here is 235 credits um, with a harpoon launcher, a throwing axe and true grit as the skill of choice there. Again, I think brawn and ferocity are the two skill trees I would give these guys. And you can see here with 150, 205 and 235 credits, that is the only expensive part of your list. Everything else is pretty damn cheap uh, and we've got a whole bunch of scabbies here. In fact, one, two, three, four, five, six seven, eight scavies here. Now four of them are mutants and four of them are regular. So we'll start off with the regular ones here. Um, we have the, the first scavy has a, a blunderbuss uh, for 55 credits and he's just your regular scavy. The second scavy here has a wild bow uh, for 35 credits. Uh, the third scavy has a musket for 35 credits. Again, no armor on any of these guys. And the fourth scavy has a ax and a reclaimed auto pistol for a little bit more close combat orientation there for 40 credits. The next four are scavy mutants. Uh, one has a reclaimed auto gun with eye stalks, uh, meaning that you can gain better benefits from cover. Uh, and that's 55 credits for that guy. The next one is 75 credits with an extra appendage and three, yes, three mauls. You can use all three of those in close combat with your extra arm. Pretty cool. The next one is 45 credits and he has a stub gun and a reclaimed auto pistol with two heads, meaning that you get the benefits of gunfighter with your two heads and a better field of vision so we can shoot those pistols off. Really nice, like a very, very, very poor man's version of the Ashwood Stranger. And then the last one we have is a, a mutant with needle spines, which are quite interesting. 
a stub gun and a sawn off shotgun for 60 credits there. Now that gets you to 990 credits, leaving the all important 10 credits for your first batch of plague zombies in your first game. Now that's a lot of fighters um, and you might not be able to use them in every scenario, but again, this is a hoardy list, so you might as well take full advantage of it because these guys are going to die fairly easily as well with no, um, no armor. Anyway, that is that for my gang list there. Of course, you could do lots of different variations of this. And like I said, if you go onto Yak Tribe or get in touch with me, give me an email, I will send you the name of this and you can clone it for your Yak Tribe usage purposes. All right, that was quite a huge undertaking, but I hope you really appreciate it. Of course, this is for the diehard Scavi lovers out there. I strongly urge you, if you are in a campaign at the moment and want to play Scavis and have some miniatures that you've made up um, for that purpose, go to your arbitrator and say, Damon said I can play Scavis, and your arbitrator will no doubt say, yeah, of course, that's fine. You know, if Damon says it, then it must be fine. Um, of course, that's not the reality. Um, some people might have an issue with this. That's fine. But I think that this is a fairly balanced, actually, as things go. Not very optimized, not very great list, but it does give you something different um, if you're that hoardy type of player. Scalies, again, they're quite interesting. They're not your usual champion. Uh, and the mutations and stuff can really be used properly here with good effect. And I think the anti-spamming sort of mechanic that I talked about at the beginning really does make them much more uh, of, a, of a real sort of viable choice in your games of Necromunda. The Plague Zombies there as well, just an extra awesome thing about Scavies. And I really do feel genuinely that this gang that I've sort of ported over here actually does really fit quite well with the current uh, gangs that you've got in Necromunda and offers something quite different as well. So, um, you know, if you don't agree with me, that's absolutely fine. Please do comment down below as well. But I do think I'm quite excited about using this anyway uh, and play testing it a little bit more. But I've done lots of deliberation and thinking and I do think that it's, um, it's pretty solid so far. So, um, yeah. Anyway, that's my opinion on that, but I'm exhausted, so I'm going to go and have some lunch. Uh, but do please like, share, subscribe, and of course, check out the Patreon as well. And I'll be back with a video on rat skins and doing exactly the same thing with that soon as well. Peace out.